Ladies and gentlemen, we have an incredible announcement to make and an incredible episode for you today. We sit down with Elmo Lebowski, son of the murdered freedom activist Anton Lebowski. Elmo grew up in Namibia and he shares with us his passion and love for his country and his passion and love for the people of Namibia and his desire to take those Namibians who are living in poverty out of poverty and to grow the wealth and the standard of living for everyone in the country. Today on our show, Elmo Lebowski announces his intention to run for the highest leadership role in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Coffee and Conversations with Champions, the Leadership Edition. We've spoken a lot um, about what you've been through, what your family's been through, what you guys have sacrificed, and above all, your connection to Namibia. So I think, May, do you want to just, for, for those who haven't listened to you before, do you maybe just want to do a quick brief introduction? Um, Elmo Lebowski, um, attorney, uh, insurance um, agent, uh, financial advisor, um, you know, yeah. in investment guru, um, skateboarder. Skateboarder. Yeah. Skateboarder. But no, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> not no, that good at skateboarding. But but I will say this, um, you know, which is interesting, just before you get into it, you're a flipping phenomenal photographer. I love the stuff you're posting on social. Just it captures a really cool vibe, and that vibe is consistent. So, yeah, um, Elmo, welcome oh. to Coffee and Conversations with Champions, the Leadership Edition. I'm in my um, Emmet shirt, not in a suit and tie, which I usually am. The reason for that is I'm packing and flying off to Cape Town just now. So we, maybe we can pick this up down there. But uh, yeah. So Elmo, can you give us a little bit of a, a rundown on who you are? Yeah, I mean, what I've uh, done in my life, or it doesn't necessarily define who I am, I guess, but um, mm. a qualified lawyer, a certified financial planner, actually post-grad in financial planning. Um, done a lot of things, yeah, legal uh, financial services. I'm not so much doing that anymore. Um, I try and use a lot of that knowledge now to um, have interesting conversations on my podcast, Business Bucks and Beach Bats. Mm. And uh, then I also sort of do legal and compliance for a diverse um, fintech company as well called Invest Capital. Um, we've got uh, a RAN based stablecoin. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, RAN based stablecoin. Um, and uh, because the, the, the podcast is not that boring that you need to play the sound of crickets yeah. <laughs> 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 it's like geez <laughs> <I> was... <laughs> I was... <laughs> you know that, that that's from a that's from a i chose that that cricket sound mm -hmm. it's like it's supposed to make you like really you know Stand up and think like, oh, what the hell is that? Well, like, yeah, it's like, <laughs> like clear. Morning conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm in Johannesburg. Yeah. The crickets pack carry carry weapons. Yeah, so we get nervous. All right, <laughs> okay. So, yep. And you got your stable coins. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I do. We. I'm a sort of a legal compliance head of legal compliance for a, a fintech a group. Mm -hmm. The group has a stable. A, a stable coin um it's got a crypto uh, managed portfolio so we do some interesting things on on that side of, of, of things more to, more for um institutional less for retail so yeah uh, we're currently in a pro currently in the process of getting licenses because in south africa you've got mm -hmm. to get um a licenses for what they call crypto asset companies casps so right. i'm currently busy with that and as i said my podcast and then yeah my passion is my social media and my uh, videos and my f photographs, as you mentioned. So yeah. thank you. Um, it's always nice to hear they are appreciated. Sometimes on Absolutely. social media, you have to be careful not to, you know, <clears throat> get too worried about, um, you know, do people actually see it? Because I, I mean, I find it with myself as well. I mainly just mm -hmm. scroll, I look through and I you know, a lot of interesting stuff, but I don't, I'm not necessarily going to comment to like someone doesn't always know what someone thinks of it. So it's always nice to get actual feedback. Yeah, so hundred percent. But yeah, that's um, content creation is, is yeah, definitely a bit of a passion of mine as well. Um, as I said, so I liked, I've got all, 
you know, you, you and me both, we've got so many ideas, so many things we mm -hmm. want to do. And um, especially with social media, I get these interesting ideas for videos. Sometimes they work. Sometimes people think they're hilarious, <clears throat> but yep, yeah, absolutely. it's my lightest. So, and I think, and I but, it, uh, yeah. Yeah, I do it mainly for me, you know, like for yeah. my own entertainment. So if yeah. I, I think some, you know, there's, there's two views with comedy because, you know, I, I also like to, you know, uh, bring it yes. in on, on a funny level. But the one is like, you shouldn't laugh at your own jokes. And I'm like, the other view is, um, you know, if you're not laughing at your own jokes, then yeah. there's no chance necessarily that someone else is going to. So you've got to talk to your audience. So, you know, I, I, there are people that, I relate to and that 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 I like will probably find some of my comedy mm -hmm. and, and ideas funny. So yeah, you know, I think if you don't yeah. find your own funny, then you laugh. <laughs> Hundred percent. The you know it's listen. If you got to be able to laugh at your own stuff, and I think we've all been through so much in the last couple of years that's been compounded on what we've been through over our lifetimes, and it's just like you know stuff it, man. Uh, you know if you find your stuff funny and you want to post it, go for it. But I think what I want to yeah. talk about on that, and um, you know, how's this for a segue? Um, you are not on any level or in any way afraid of showing the world who you are, what you're thinking, what you're feeling. You are an incredibly authentic person. That's you know, having, and I've known you for a long time. So you're not you're not putting out a persona. Um, I think if, if you looked at many, um, you know, and I think what I want to chat to you about today is Namibia, sort of the country mm. of your, your origin, your birth, you, that you and your family sacrificed a great deal for. And, uh, you know, I want to be the guy where you nominate your uh, potential intention to run, not like Donald Trump, where 40 years he was denied, 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 ding. <laughs> so, but I think yeah. you, you, you are very, very authentic. And I think maybe this is a good opportunity for us just to chat about sort of your feelings about, I mean, is, is it home still? Where do you have two homes? Do you have one home? I know for myself, Johannesburg is home. And when I'm in Cape Town, Cape Town's also home. And they have different yeah. connections because I was at different stages of my life. Um, so yeah, let, let's chat about, you know, what's your relationship with with Namibia? Tell us about your your love and your passion for no, that. I still, I still definitely see it as home, um, mm. and I go back on a regular basis. At the moment, it is often um, just my grandmother, one of my grandmothers, uh, the only grandparent I have that's still alive, is, is staying in Swakopmund, mm -hmm. and I often go and visit her. So, but with that, I always try and uh, see if I can go back to Vintuk as well, which is uh, my where I was born and uh, reconnect with people, friends, and also look at business opportunities. I've been mm -hmm. kind of looking at um, over the last couple of years, you know, how can I become more active and how can I do something in Namibia to, you know, um, contribute as well uh, to the economy and, you know, do something in my country of, of birth. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. we moved to South Africa after my dad was um, killed Murdered. in 1989. Murdered, yeah, assassinated. Mm. Um, yeah. And a part of that was, you know, moving away was because my mother still felt there were some safety issues. You know, it, it was because there was no, no one prosecuted, because there was nothing really drastic happening with bringing anyone to, to um, you know, to account for his assassination. Mm. Uh, it was uncertain you know, as to, it could have been anyone. It could have been... Um, his own party could have been involved. I mean, that has been, uh, it's a contentious issue, but you, you know, you don't know whether people within his uh, a party that were involved, was it uh, people that his party were friendly with that mm -hmm. were involved? You know, there's lots of theories around that. So my mother didn't feel safe in some respects, and we moved to family in South Africa. Um, the Cape Town would have been the ideal and natural choice but there was mm. you know there was my in family down here but my mother decided to to go and uh, uh, move to Pretoria which was a strange place actually all things considered because it was pre-95 South mm. African democracy 
in elections. So theoretically, we're going from an independent Namibia, which got independent in 1990, just very soon after my dad's assassination. And um, then, you know, it, it was still apartheid South Africa, if you can call mm -hmm. it that, you know. Um, yeah. And it was it, to the headquarters of apartheid South Africa in Pretoria. My dad's sister, one of his, his older sister was staying there and uh, they accommodated us um, in some way, you know, the move. Um, and that's where we moved to. And it's funny how, you know, from, from my perspective, that's, I'd, I had little choice in that matter, um, but I had to make the best of it. And uh, mm. Pretoria became also a bit of a, a home. I've still got very good friends and I finished school there. I ended up also staying for university because the studying law at the time, mm -hmm. there was a lot of changes degree and it was, it, it just was at that, I was accepted at UCT as well, but for various reasons, it was just simpler to just finish my law degree in, in Pretoria. So I've also got an affinity with Pretoria, not so much Joburg, but also stayed there for, mm. for some time, but yeah, Namibia is, is definitely still a home. Um, but I've been, as I said, trying to, you know, do something to, to find a way to potentially permanently be in Namibia as well, mm, mm. um, with some of the, the ideas I may have, you know, to, 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 to contribute in Namibia. Okay. Yeah. So if we look at young Elmo, so you, you still got your dad. What was that like growing up with your father? What were sort of the conversations around life in Namibia, what he was trying to do, what he was trying to achieve? What are the lessons that young Elmo picked up from his father? Well, I think, I think first of all, I've, one has to say that, I mean, yes, my dad's assassination was a drastic event and yeah, you know, um, sure. trauma in my, in my life, right? But um, what... I don't necessarily always talk about, or I mean, I don't necessarily talk about that in any event, but um, the period before that, you know, my dad was um, an, an Afrikaans white male, right? That was, that decided to join an opposition party, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that was fighting against basically apartheid. Namibia is a slightly different just for historical purposes. Namibia is a slightly, slightly different to, Namibia, to South Africa because South Africa wasn't given occupation of, of um, uh, Namibia in after mm. the Second World War because it was a German colony. So Germany lost the war um, in, in the Second World War and they started dividing up the colonies um, and it was what is called the sea mandate, which means it was close to being able to potentially govern itself, but South Africa would take care of it um just you know to to uh, to lead it to independence mm. um and this, after the second world war nothing really happened south africa essentially um if you look at the south african government and especially the the apartheid government um the nationalist uh, government the national party government in south africa kind of saw it as another province mm -hmm. so they yeah. they liked keeping it and there was obviously a, there still is a lot of trade between the two countries and there was a port Walfish bay um, as well that they could use. And there was obviously lots of natural resources, diamonds, and then, and fishing that mm. South Africa benefited from. And in 1978, the UN security council declared, um, South Africa in illegal occupation of Namibia right. uh, in 1978, the year that I was born, interestingly enough, um, the UN security council passed resolution 435 and yeah, the word or the phrase resolution 435 was something that I heard numerous times from my dad <laughs> because there was, there was basically an international uh, UN resolution that Namibia could say South Africa is in illegal occupation of our mm -hmm. country and they need to let us go and have democratic fair elections. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, obviously, was then the fact that South Africa was in the 80s, then apartheid was seen as something as an injustice, you know, being committed by South Africa. I don't know, yeah. necessarily know all the legalities around that. How the, but basically, the UN also sanctioned, I think, South Africa at that point. So Namibia was basically saying, you, South Africa is an illegal occupation of us. 
Um, they need to let us have democratic, fair, free and fair elections. Plus, on top of this, they're imposing the system of apartheid on us, which is also now being seen as um, an injustice by the mm -hmm. international community. Uh, that was the fight. Um, but yeah, my dad was, to get back to that, my dad was, as I said, an Afrikaans male. He had studied, he was in Paul Ruiz. He studied at the University of Stellenbosch. He then went to uh, UCT to finish his law degree, also leaving Stellenbosch at the time because it was a little less liberal as UCT. And, um, you know, he was already involved in a bit of student politics at the time. And yeah, he joined, he went to uh, Namibia, became a, a, an advocate there and started getting cases around um, people that were disappeared in exile, political activists mm -hmm. in exile, um, detainees, people that had been detained, um, you know, under ter something like the Terrorism Act, which allowed police to detain you for 180 days without trial. Mm. And my dad himself was incarcerated six times. So he was seen as a, in the community, he was seen as a traitor. And we had to deal with that as kids. I was bullied mm. at school. Um, you know, uh, we had to leave the German school in, in Vintuk because, um, you know, the, the kids were, were, were not very friendly towards us because their parents at home were talking about my dad. Um, what, he also what, had. Yeah. What was that like? I mean, if you talk us through that, what were those experiences yeah, I mean, that, like? Very tough as a kid, you know. So my dad had to explain to us, and it was very, especially me. Mm. Um, I can't talk to my sister, but I think she does say that she was a little bit more. She didn't necessarily pay that much attention to what was happening around her. She was a bit more carefree. But mm. I, as a child, you know, I, I remember specifically, you know. Also, because I was affected by it, I wanted to understand. I wanted to know what was going on. And my dad explained this to me. So the, the sense of the injustice that was happening, mm. the fact that he was standing up for something that definitely seemed like the right thing to me, um, not being too influenced by other things, but basic, you know, my dad fought for equality. My dad fought for basic equality, that no one should be treated differently based on anything, race, sex, uh, gender, whatever else, you know, the, a lot of these things have only come out. And unfortunately, for instance, in Namibia, um, you know, race equality sure has been achieved. Um, but for instance, um, you know, your choice to decide on or, or, or go with your sexual orientation, for instance, is very uh, different in Namibia. Namibia still doesn't have, isn't as progressive as South Africa in allowing mm -hmm. gay marriages for and things like that. So there's a lot that still needs to change in Namibia. And that's one of the reasons I feel, I think there's a lot to still do in Namibia. Not mm -hmm. just that's one example, there's a lot of other things. Regardless of uh, poverty, I mean, the, the fact that there's so much poverty in a country of only two and a half million people, you know, is also something that's... Um, um, with that level that of national resources and and you know sort of the wealth the 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 wealth that's in the ground that's within that so growing yeah. up you you really were i mean you grew up in a very firm or in very harsh reality right from a quite a young yeah. age you know you, you understood yeah. that what was happening to you and the reasons behind that how has that sort of shaped you and your view on the world um it's an interesting question i mean i definitely have always um you know i th i think mainly what it has made me do is 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 try and understand people on an individual level mm -hmm. because you know i i you know i mean i think this is this is one of the things that's you know i, I also realize that it's yes it's possible to change things on a on a very big level, like my dad did in some degree, but it comes at an extremely high cost. Mm. Um, death in my dad's case, you know, and but, ridicule before that. Yeah, I was going to say the what you guys were living with that leading up to that, and then after your dad was assassinated, effectively having to flee for your own safety, leave your home. Yeah, pretty much, and not understanding where we were and where we fitted in. Mm. You know, my dad had. had given up so much, we had lost so much, and it didn't seem like we were being um, taken care of even in, in, in a lot of ways afterwards, yeah. you know, so we were sitting without a, a breadwinner, with, I was without a father, my, my mother was without, um, I mean, they had already 
separated and, and they had their own problems. But my dad was was very much a caregiver to my mother as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and a breadwinner still. My mom had given up years of her life to raise us as children and suffered as well and needed to keep the home situation going because my dad was hard, hardly there. You know, right. um, That's where I also learned a lot about quality time, not quantity time. I didn't ever feel the lack of my father, but mm -hmm. I know factually was gone a lot he was overseas he was you know doing he was he had a job he was uh, political he was running unions um for 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 the party so he was extremely busy um but yeah i never felt the lack of him and i always right. knew that what he was doing was important but yeah what but i must say for many years it 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 was a it it was something where i didn't want to step out into any kind of um uh, obvious sort of put myself in a position as a target, you know, so yeah, like no but, spotlight. I yeah, yeah. Under the spotlight and, and, and definitely said that I never wanted to go into politics. Mm. Um, also, I don't think my dad was a politician at all. I think, you know, as I said, he was very much fighting and he wanted, he didn't feel there was equality. This, whatever was mm. happening, the fact that Libya wasn't independent, that it that couldn't have its own elections, the fact that South Africa was imposing an apartheid system and a totally unjust uh, system um, that wasn't allowing for true equality between, uh, you know, citizens of the country. You know, he was, um, he, he wanted to implement it. And I don't think he was necessarily convinced about any kind of ideology, you know, is, was, you know, sure, uh, parties like the ANC, Swapo were seen as, as communist to some degree, as very socialist. Mm. I don't think he necessarily thought about that yet. The point was we weren't in a state where we were equal, where we were in a democratic system to now decide how, what philosophies, economic philosophies you want to implement. What he was very adamant about is that Namibian resources were not seeing, uh, or the, the Namibian people were not seeing the benefit of Namibian resources. Right. Unfortunately, where we see today, that hasn't changed. So there's right. no equality with regard to, to economic equality. I think that's, that's, that's definitely a, something that still needs to change. Um, and a very touchy subject, um, if you bring it up with the current uh, ruling party, you know, um, which I am a member of still. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, you know, um, because I do think that you can have discourse and you can have disagreement within a party um, mm -hmm. as well. And I do believe very much that if that party is still the choice of the majority of the people, then you need to do what you need to do to change the party from within rather right. than creating an opposition necessarily. Some people believe in opposition politics. I kind of believe in, um, you know, where your roots are, it's like your religion in some respects, mm -hmm. often, you know, you don't, some people are born into a religion, you're not easily going to change that. Do we all serve a similar God? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think there's no difference really, um, between a Christian, a Jewish and a Muslim God. Um, mm -hmm. Ultimately, you know, it's, it's a higher power. Um, right. Your traditions you grow up, that's how you were born and you don't easily change that. Yeah. Um, I mean, and yeah, your, your so. connections to the party run as, as deep as possible, right? I mean, as, as within the country, you know, that um, yeah. I remember you posted recently, um, or even a few years ago when you were there with your, the memorial to your dad, how it's sort of in a bit of uh, disarray and uh, not wasn't being maintained um, as well as it should have been, if I remember correctly. Mm. You know, we, we need... And I think that's something that's very prevalent within South Africa as well, is we need very deep, strong connections to our past. You know, where mm -hmm. for the, the ANC, for example, needs to understand what was the intention and the belief system of that original leadership. Why was the party founded? You know, and, and that's yeah. the thing, to, to maintain those high standards of these intellectual people that were very connected to the suffering yeah. and the struggle of the people that they they effectively got elected uh or started the party went to prison for were yeah. murdered for in order to serve so i think if we talk about namibia I mean, like the wealth is i mean it is quite i mean i think everybody knows the fishing and the diamonds and so on give us a little bit of a rundown because you know we're fortunate that the these uh the these shows are watched internationally so give us a little bit of a rundown on 
on Namibia and uh, the country, uh, your passion for it, what makes it so special as well? And then also, I think if we can lead well, I, that into what would you like to see for the country? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Namibia is still actually very much um, a, a very beautiful country. Um, you know, most of it desert, but um, beautiful, beautiful um, country to, to visit. And I think there's a lot of international people that do see, have it on their radar as mm. a place to go visit. Um, people extremely friendly. I also feel that um, compared to South Africa, you know, sure, I mean, maybe you have crime and you have a, a lot of things, but I think generally people are a lot um, calmer and a lot um, more relaxed in Namibia and very friendly. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and diverse everyone in, in the country. So I think there's so much potential in terms of just harnessing that. And, uh, you know, it, it, it does make it easier because it, it, it's only two and a half million people. It's very, um, it's not very sure. heavily populated. So, you know, once you go to Namibia, you'll soon probably know just about everyone there. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, so much potential. Um, and yeah, I just think that maybe over the years, a little bit more could have been done. And it, as I said, it just, it, I don't understand what the amount of resources that it has and the amount of possible and the abundance of possibilities, mm -hmm. why there are still people in poverty. Um, it could be an educational thing. It could be an opportunity. Who knows? But I mean, we also do need to recognize as in South Africa that a system of, you know, um, constant depression over not just apartheid years, but over centuries, you know, mm. um, does have an effect on, on the psyche of, of, of people. It's so almost like ge genetic uh, trauma where that, that carries through. Yeah, yeah. It, mm. it can. And maybe just that, that not that inability then to like look beyond, you know, just uh, surviving for the next day and, and, you know, possibilities, but it's, these things are difficult. I mean, they're so multifaceted, but I think Namibia is, is, is almost like, for me, it just feels like it's not an, I, I don't, I don't want to use the word easy, but it just seems like a manageable uh, mm. uh, thing to tackle to get, to get to a better place as a country right. to ensure that more people um, are not living in, on, in poverty and that there's just, and that not, you know, uh, as most of the wealth is going to a small amount of people for whatever reason that is. Um, yeah. Um, just so many opportunities there that I think can be, can be looked at. I think for what, what would your sort of blue sky, your dream be for the country, for the population? What would you like to see happen in, in, in a perfect world? You know, where would you like to see the country head? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I think I think the main thing is that um, that it's to me it's just crazy that so many people are still living in in, in poverty. So I think mm -hmm. to to eradicate poverty in Namibia is is a number one number one thing that needs to happen. Um, right. Be it with existing um, you know resources, which is difficult because I think there's a lot of um, you know, there's with resources I've seen, if you think about it, you know, some people mentioned the fact that like in South Africa, the gold was sold long ago and in Namibia, the diamonds were sold long ago, you know, so can they still benefit the everyday person? <laughs> Difficult to say, um, mm. it create, you know, the other option is to create, you know, new industries, you know, I mean, that's the other thing, like, you know, um, legalization of, you know, hemp and marijuana mm. and things like that, you know, is that something that could help? But one needs to look at this, one needs to have those open conversations and see what's possible in Namibia so that you can eradicate um, a poverty. Mm. And then I think the other thing is just to, an ideal world would be just to have um, more general equality in all areas, not just race equality and economic equality to some degree. Um, but all kinds of equality, you know, not to have, you know, and, and I go, I say this based on social media comments, some media comments and things like that. It mm -hmm. just doesn't seem like Namibia has gone beyond. And I think that's also an economic thing because as you become more economically equal and be, and people have more economic freedom, you start being able to, you know, read more and understand mm -hmm. more and therefore you'll be more tolerant and, include everyone in, 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 in bringing the country together and moving forward, you know, and I think that to some degree, 
sometimes you know we've in south africa we've managed to have all the right laws and mm. equality laws and, and things like that do we still have people you know um talking inequality in a lot of ways yes and and attacking each other and there's a lot of um verbose you know um rhetoric between people like you've got a party like the EFF in South Africa that seems very angry still and people that follow it seem very angry and people in Namibia look at this and go yeah we're not like this really in Namibia we're a lot more tolerant with each other mm. which I think is to some degree so I think on an everyday basic level that is the case but yeah where do I want to see Namibia I think Namibia should just be no one should be poor in Namibia that's for sure right I think because, as you said, it's a lot easier to eradicate poverty there, right? Or a lot simpler. Um, I think, simpler, you know, yeah. if you look and at the inner, and, and, yeah, and if you look at the inner city of Johannesburg, you've got uh, a million people living, living legitimately within the inner city of Johannesburg. So, you know, that's mm. nearly half the population of Namibia. Um, putting that into perspective. And I, I think from a tourism point of view and a resource point of view, you know, you look at the port at Volfus Bay, you look at that structure. It's not that far from Cape Town. It's not that far from Durban. So, you know, we just need mm. some railway junctions built in and you, you can have, mm. you know, a great transport hub, um, a great logistics mm. hub into that part of of Africa. The the tourism is, is unbelievable. You know, we're fortunate to have a lot of doctors um, from Europe, from Australia, some from the US come and train with us and they will want to go, you know, Skeleton Coast, go on those tours. Um, so yeah. I think, listen, you know, let's chat about it. Um, you know, are you willing to look at running for office within Namibia? <laughs> well, definitely. I mean, I think, I think, yep. I think I've We've chatted about it, and mm -hmm. and and I've, you know, I definitely, if there's an opportunity to run for president in Namibia, um, I definitely, I think it would be a completion of my dad's yeah. uh, path that he started. A, a continuation, maybe a continuation rather, the next generation. Yeah, right? mm. yeah, of that, I think that that if I'm going to um, be in Namibia, which 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 is something that I do want to do and be there more permanently then definitely I, I think it would be and maybe that's why I haven't gone back to actually stay there because I feel like if I did go stay there mm. I have no choice but to make sure that I get involved on a on a political level right um, and 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 see what I can contribute uh, if that ends up in presidency that's a possibility sure but it you know to make a change and to make a difference it doesn't necessarily mean you become the official president if anything, mm. you know, who knows, um, social media and things, you know, you can be, you can influence the way things look and maybe president means something a little bit different. You know, um, there's an official president, which often in, in African countries, if you look at South Africa as well, some people have less respect for <laughs> and, yeah. um, and some have a lot of respect for. But yeah, I mean, if you actually want to make a change, you know, you, you need to be at the forefront. Um, so yeah, it would definitely be how that would happen. The how is is not something that I've necessarily thought about. But yeah, I definitely think that um, it would be carrying on in my dad's footsteps and, and something that he would have wanted me to do is to is to make a difference. And that could definitely turn into a presidency for sure. You know, I think and, and to ask you a very personal question, because I'm asking this because of the, you know, for how long I've known you. Um, and and the time that we spend together, do you feel that this has always been something that's been building up within you, or waiting waiting for you, effectively? You know, with everything that you've done, from the the law to the financial services to gaining all of these skills in these different markets. You know, is this sort of mm. something that that subconsciously or consciously that's been waiting for you, and that you've been guiding yourself towards? Maybe not always consciously, but, you know, I mean, there is, an, there is a possibility that our path is laid out for us before we even take it. And what I have mm. definitely done and what I can advise anyone to do, uh, although it's not always easy, is to follow your intuition, to follow your inner voice, to be clear about what that mm. inner voice is, go and, you know, and to follow that. So I, you know, I, yes, I've also taken 
um, a lot of um, criticism for doing so many different things, you know, and not focusing. But I think it's definitely where I am now, being a bit older, mm -hmm. I have no regrets in terms of, you know, taking the different part, having the different experiences. Often it was just to have a job or it was just to have some income to be able to provide for my family. Mm -hmm. But I've always kind of sat, thought about things and gone, and then idea springs up, which is like your intuition. I go, yes. And I wasn't afraid to study something else. I wasn't afraid to mm -hmm. go do something else, um, experience something else, put myself in an uncomfortable situation often. You know, I mean, we met in a time where I decided, okay, yeah, I didn't even know anything about insurance. I was studying the postgrad in financial planning because I wanted to add that to my legal degree. Next mm. thing I was asked, should I be selling insurance and, and becoming an insurance agent? And I thought, you know what, this is a learning experience. I need to do it from that perspective. Yeah. And I need to understand the workings of, of how this works, not just be someone with a postgrad diploma in financial planning, understanding the theory and never having gone to do a, a needs analysis or a financial plan for someone. Right. So I did it. And I think that that has definitely not necessarily been for a specific purpose, except to learn and to, mm. to add to my skill, and become useful. I think that's one of the um, main things that I've learned to define. I want to be useful to the world. Right. So the more yeah. I'm that's well, useful and, i can yeah. eat you know and having a legal structure background and then having particularly from uh, working as a financial advisor or insurance agent that understanding of basic finance or basic financial structures for families mm. for individuals what things cost how to plan how to save how to invest you know you can do that from a country point of view and all the way down yeah. to the individual point of view. And if you understand the individual, wealth creation and bringing people out of poverty is a great thing. But there needs yeah. also to be understanding of you're, you're being lifted out of poverty, you're having wealth created, but what do you now do with that wealth? Is it going to buy yeah. a car? Is it going to buy suits? Yeah. Is it looking... And I think, unfortunately, it's something we see very prevalent within South Africa, within the youth and you know, where they are looking to impress. It's the the fake it until you make it, but it's what is even being faked. You know, it's where mm. people have, they have a great car, but they don't have furniture at home. So these are the yeah, things yeah. where it's the delayed gratification. Think, you know, yep. yeah. And I also think that getting someone out of poverty definitely doesn't mean you just give them a bunch of money because that'll probably mm. be gone. You need to, you know, it's, it's about Absolutely. education, about basic education. It's about financial literacy and mm. education. Uh, these are all things that you need to um, assist people with even before they get their next big paycheck. Yeah. You know, so getting some poverty does, definitely doesn't mean just giving them a bunch of money or even, you know, giving even giving them a job um, mm. wouldn't and then get money from it wouldn't necessarily lift them out of poverty. They don't know how to manage the money that they then suddenly get because they go from nothing or very little mm. living on grants to earning something decent in a sal from, from a salary and then not doing the right things with it. Yeah. Um, there's obviously a lot of other things to address. Like I'm sure there's a lot of um, addiction problems within in poor communities and things like that that also need to address. So it's multifaceted. Mm. So you've got to have an understanding of all kinds of areas you know, to, to see if there's a way you can, you can assist and fix that. To, to um, move on that. But Absolutely. Mm. I also think that that is something, you know, becoming president. And as I said, although I've got every ambition to do that, if my path takes me that I'm also very conscious about, yes, I will look at, it will be something that I've got there and I will take paths that maybe lead to it. But I also have to be led to that point. I've definitely mm. in life, wanted or thought something is a good idea and nothing in the next while leads me in any way to that particular point. Then I've got to realize my, my time is now spent or meant to be spent somewhere else. Right. But, um, you know, yes, presidency is there and it would be a top down thing that you could, you could change. But I think bottom up is also something that I'm very much believe in and you've got to be doing things on the ground mm -hmm. um, and influence people on an everyday level as well. And to go back to something I mentioned previously is 
you know, that's why I do feel that a lot of impact that I can have and what I realized rather than being like my dad that was stepped up into the spotlight, mm -hmm. wanted to make a big change and did, is to also do that on a day-to-day -day individual level with people. And that's right. why I'm, you know, I became very good with, with, with uh, interacting with people on an everyday basis, you know, anyone and able to talk to, I think anyone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then see, you know, how I can add value to, to their life, how I can be useful to them on, on an everyday level as well. Okay. A hundred percent. Dude, I think that, you know, uh, it, it's very cool to say that, uh, well, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. I got I got a presidential nomination on the podcast. Tucker Carlson, eat your heart out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, let's see yeah. when that is. You know? yeah, yeah, but I, uh, I think you know just the sense that I get from you, and you speak about that intuition and that sense, that inner voice. But I get a sense almost it might it's like your dad, you know, leading you along the way to say, you know. This is this is where you you're going to, my boy, and you know you know this is the work that needs to be continued, uh, because I mean mm. you grew up that that that's your belief system, right? Your understanding, you know, fight injustice, mm. uh, create fairness and equal opportunity for everyone, and where you have a country that, you know, as you know, two and a half million people, there, there's an opportunity to really make a profound difference. To a country, I mean, what what a wonderful way to live one's life and to spend one's life. You know, for me, with my sobriety, um, you know, build build a quality life in the service of others, and you know, th there's mm. no higher value for oneself in reality um, than to do that. So, yeah. I, I think it would be phenomenal. You'd bring a wonderful sense of humor. You'd also be your, the only president, I think, with his own comedy hour on TV. Um, <laughs> late night well sure. i mean yeah, huh? you've <laughs> got that uh, ukrainian president garland you see a comedian, comedian well. yeah well they, exactly Come here, he played a president and then you went like hmm, how bad can it be huh you can be the okay. you do it the opposite way that Zelensky did it become president first and then you know sort of the comedian yeah. but i think your understanding yeah. of what's real and you know the sacrifice that you and your family have made you know you and i joke about it because we talked you know we were joking about affirmative action right like your family paid the ultimate price and you got none of the benefit in south africa yeah uh, you know yeah, so yeah. but at least within namibia there's you know there's an understanding of who you are who your family is what was done and what was sacrificed and i think really for you, it's it's time on the ground now, you know, going to meet people, to speak to people. I know I think the education thing, the financial literacy thing is something that's big for you and is important. And, um, you know, that, that I think could be a great starting point. So I'm very excited to to see where yeah. you go with this because it is kind of cool. Uh, you know, so, hey, yeah. I know a guy. <laughs> well, I mean, also, I, I think you're definitely someone that needs to be in because i mean this this kind of thing doesn't happen mm -hmm. with just me involved i yeah. think you need a team around you um so yeah definitely definitely um would would uh, pull you in in, in, in that Sweet. respect um, yeah 100 <laughs> percent absolutely i think and that's at the time yeah. doing so many different things yeah. meeting people you know i've also identified so many um people that would add so much value mm. in a team like that that you could pull in or just a, that could advise you and that could yeah. um, be there. And we've definitely one of those people that is, that came into my life and, and, you know, um, we've always uh, managed to, you know, I've always managed to find some kind of inspiration or you've, you've uh, edged me on in some other way to think, to think again. And you're actually also one of the first that, that did put, well, it's something that I obviously thought about, but one of the first people that definitely, that definitely, said it out of their own and said you know what about becoming president of namibia and you know you should definitely do it so yeah. you know that's and since then you know a couple of others have but yeah you would definitely be one of the first that, that did that and yeah um so yeah, just I, know, I see those values within you and and thank you, you know? 
I see the values within you. It's you know, and if anyone wants to see um, Elmo's honesty and intre- integrity and genuineness, go and follow him on social media. So you're not afraid to be you. You're not afraid to say what's on your mind, and you have that integrity. Mm-hmm. You have that honesty. You worked for or with the financial services board. You know the the, the FSB, right? You know, keeping an mm-hmm. eye on all of us smoses. Um, you know, those are the things. So you understand that. Leg- um, regulatory framework as well so yeah that's something that's yeah, very yeah. very cool so dude thank you and you know thank you for your time and i will chat i'll chat awesome. you quickly as well but uh yeah so i'm looking forward to seeing uh seeing what's well, next thanks dude. for having me on oh, and brother. hopefully there's someone that that uh yeah uh found some you and but, um yeah um definitely also open to to link up wherever yeah. on whichever platform you can and pretty people, much find people me. can message you sort of your name there I'm trying to get the finger alignment right at elmo oh, you know it's yeah. elmo lebowski on on instagram and, on LinkedIn. My name and, and yeah. all my handles are at elmo lebowski so yeah okay um, perfect follow. yep follow message comment give your vote of support voting starts now mm. all right <laughs> i'll chat to you now dude thank you elmo cheers cheers